Your team had been in the postseason one time in 23 <laughs> years, and here comes Jimmy Round said, we're the team to beat. Right, right. Why'd you say it? We want to be respected for playing hard, running the bases hard. I get it, I, I, I get that part, but where's the talk about winning? Struck him out, Philadelphia Phillies 2008 World Champions of Baseball. And that, 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 was, that was the most important thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're at Jimmy's mansion. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Rollins, welcome Just to Baseball Stories. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this, man. Sure. All right, so you just came through the 10-year anniversary celebration of the 2008 Phillies team that won the World Series. Swing and a miss, struck him out. The Philadelphia Phillies are 2008 World Champions of Baseball. You know, when you win, those bonds are forever, and those memories are forever. And I wonder if you were struck by that during the celebration, that right, you, you won one World Series, and now you get to live it forever. Forever. Um, you know what, it's, you know, going to the field and watching things on a big screen brings back memories. Just not that you forget things, it's just so much happens in 10 years. And then you get to go back and watch, and it's like, wow, I remember that play. And everybody's high five and you know, doing the same curtain calls, choose, show me, one nine, just all those little things that you don't forget. They're just not in there until something sparks it. And then, you know, we get to come back and hang around and, and just hang out with one another, and all the stories start coming back. You know, I was thinking, you you and I have known each other a long time, like something like 18 years. It's yeah. crazy. And when you showed up in Philadelphia in September of 2000, right? Yeah. I mean, this was a team that almost lost 100 games. It finished 30 games out of first place. Were that bad? Something like that. <laughs> wow. And, and wow. But, but you were talking almost from the beginning about how you needed to change the tradition, yep. and you needed to change the mindset, and you needed to change the culture. Yep. Why were you so vocal about it? Uh, that's, that's the way I was raised, honestly. You know, my mindset was, was one of such that when I'm out there, when I'm doing something, I'm going to find a way to win. If I'm not, if I can't do it, I'm going to inspire other people to do it. And like you said, losing 100 games is not cool. I mean, we were on that verge. And spring training, you hear the talk about we want to be respected for playing hard, running the bases hard. And I was like, so how does that help us win? I get it. I, I, I get that part. But where's the talk about winning? And that was always missing, and I never lost focus of that. We all had successes growing up, uh, probably being the best who we, who I mean, the best of the group around our neighborhood or where where you're from. Um, so you, you become used to success, and there was no reason for that to stop just because you're at the big leagues and a team hasn't had success since '93, which I was well aware of. I was a Ricky Henderson fan, so I know a lot about '93. Um, but why should we, you know? consider ourselves to be respected, or why should we have the ambition just to go out there and be respected for hustling and, and you know, going first to third? Like, I want to be respected for winning, like the Braves were. I watched them, I got the play. That's, that, that's who I want to be like. I want to be like the Yankees. I want to win. You know, regardless, you hustle, you bust your butt down the line on every single play, that's great. But if it doesn't result in winning, what, what, what good is at the end of the day? I think that brings us to, um what a lot of people would consider to be kind of your defining moment as a Philly, and it's not even something that happened on the field. Before the 2007 season, the we're the team to beat yeah. speech, quote. I think we ought to stand to beat in the NL East, uh, you know, finally. And just let's remember the context, right? The Braves run right. had just ended. Yep. The Mets had just Knocked won. Them off. Your yeah. team had been in the postseason one time in 23 <laughs> years. And here comes Jimmy Rollins saying, we're the team to beat. Right, right. Wow. Um, when you said that, 
I know you've always said this. You, you always talk for a reason. So let's talk about the reason. Right. Why'd you say it? Uh, we had uh, made a couple moves, but more than anything, th that Bray's mystique was over. And, and, and my, my eyes, it ended. It was just who was going to be the one to knock them off, and the Mets were the team to do that. After that, I'm like, well, it's up for grabs now. They won. It, it's, you know, when you beat the champ, you're not the champ. You have to establish yourself as a champ. The Braves had done that. The Mets knocked them off. But that doesn't mean you're the champ. So you were just the guys that come through and, and knock them off the pedestal. So I honestly felt it was up for grabs. And secondly, I was tired of going home in <laughs> September after 162, to be honest. It was just like, this isn't cool. I, I'm not here for that. And like I said, I didn't know how anyone was going to beat the Braves. But when it happened, I'm like, all right, it's, it's, a, it's up for grabs. And why not us? OK, well, when you said it, I think a lot of people interpreted it as being aimed at the Mets. But here's my question. Was that aimed at the Mets or the guys that you played with? 100% the guys I played with. Interesting. And, and, but I'm glad it worked out the way it did, <laughs> um, you know, because they started feeling the pressure coming down that stretch. But no, it was, it was a message to the organization um, and our guys. And remember what hap things happened before that in 2006. Uh, Pat Gillick made some trades. He came out and said that, you know, we probably won't be competitive for another three years, which is like 2009. <laughs> and I, I told Pat, I was pissed. I'm pissed, <laughs> but in a good way. Like, no, like, no, that's, you, you didn't make those trades to rebuild. You made those trades to clear the way. And it's my turn to step up as leader. I'm not going to be in a clubhouse, hoo rah rah, and all that stuff. But my leadership style is, is different, but this, this is our turn. All you did was clear the way. You didn't, you didn't make us less competitive. You cleared the way for us to show who we really are. Curveball striking around. The Phillies are National League East champions. But that day, after 162, when we're, we're popping bottles, first division title since I don't know when, but that was our first as a group, it literally felt like somebody took a building off my back. The game has its own set of rules. Don't make the last out of third. But as soon as that thought entered my mind frame, I said, F it. And Rollins drills one deep right field. That one is well hit, and that one is gone. Jimmy Rollins. Jim, what do you say we do a little film study with some of our favorite Jimmy Rollins moments? Yeah, right. Start with the next to the last game of the season in 2008. You need a little show, a little Jimmy Rollins defense. Tell me what you all see right. here. So, you know, it, when, when Brad came in, we all prayed. You know, we all prayed. It's like, let's just have one, one, two, three in it. But Brad was a little more excitable than that. Yeah, he but was. here we are, obviously. Uh, I think he's 39 for 39 at that point, whatever it was. Um, hadn't blown had, the save. Had, yeah, just hadn't blown the save all season long. And Ryan Zimmerman comes up, and I'm just like, all right. Normally in this situation, I would want to cover the five hole. But you have a slider ball pitcher and Brad Ledge. Zimmerman loves to hit the ball the right, to, to the right center side, especially with runners on. So I just kind of shift it a little bit to the media. I mean, to, to the middle. I'm just like... I'm taking a chance, and if he hits this ball in this hole, I'm going to be so pissed. But it worked out well, and Brad's season you know, was preserved then. But more than anything, that was, that was a clinching game for us. And it's like, this is really going to happen. All right, how about this one? This is, this is probably my favorite Jimmy Rollins moment. Game four, 2009 NLCS. You're down to your last out. Yeah. You're down by a run. Look what happens. Tell us about it. So, I mean, it, it was just improbable that I even got to the plate there. But I faced Jonathan a number of times, and he always found a way to get me out. I mean, we, you know he throws 100 miles per hour. He, he has a little wrinkle slider, but he doesn't like to get to it. So I'm walking up to the plate. Even before I'm on deck, I'm saying, catch the ball. Catch the ball. You know, it would be nice to hit a home run. Now just do a single pass a baton. Just, just do your job. So all these thoughts are going through your head when you're on deck. I'm walking up to the plate, ball one, or strike one, whichever it was, get to the one-one count. You know what he's coming with. Just catch the ball. 
time stops, the ball comes off, and I'm like, there's the sinker. Line drive, right center field, base hit. I thought the ball was two feet maybe over the second baseman head, just kind of right center. The single's done, perfect. Tie game, let's go on to the next guy. Then it's shooting up the gap. Who was it? Bruntlett came around, scored, and then Chute is coming around. The game's over. And then everybody comes on top of me. One second, the Dodgers were going to win the game. Yes. The Dodgers were going to tie this series. You were going to go back to L.A. Yeah, we didn't want to do that. And then everything changed with that swing of the bat. There have only been two other hits in postseason history. Walk-off, extra base hits, where a team was down to its last out, about to lose, and then that hit won the game. Yep. And the only other ones in our lifetime was the Kirk Gibson yeah. off Dennis Exley. Yeah, and like I said, being wow. on the other side of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, now here's another one. This is the last game of the 2007 regular season. If you win, you're going to clinch the division. But if you get a triple, you're going to be the first 20, 20, 20, 20 man in the National League since Willie Mays. So what happened, Jim? We coming down, I think was at the seventh or eighth inning it was. I'm like, you know what? You're throwing me that slider. Sure enough, he throws a slider. And what I do, flip it out. Just like my first hit in the big leagues, just, just flip the ball out. What does the ball do? Austin, obviously, like Austin has to be close. He's coming down, ball bounces, he can't get there. His momentum takes him to the wall. The ball hits the wall, and exactly as I saw it, it yeah. bounces back towards the infield. Now, I'm still playing baseball. I hit the ball, there's a double. Don't make the last out of third. That's what goes through your head, because you, you're taught to do that. Your natural instincts are, regardless of what's needed, you know, personally, the game has its own set of rules. Don't make the last out of third. But as soon as that thought entered my mind frame, I said, F it. Literally, like, and I'm going. And I'm coming around. I hit second base. And I'm like, I'm going right through you, Zim. Like, I'm hitting you. Like, like this is football, and you're the linebacker, and I'm coming through that hole. I'm hitting you. <laughs> because I knew I needed every single inch to be safe. I needed every stride to be perfect, because I know Austin's going to come up gunning. Like, he can big arm, and he's coming towards the infield. So sure enough, you know, I'm, I'm coming around, and I see Zim, he's starting to straddle that bag, and I'm going to the outside. I'm like, if the throw's on the inside, it, you know, that, that gives me a little more room to swing around the bag, and his knee is right there. I went so hard into his knee. <laughs> and my neck was so sore for the next month, wow. but it was worth it. It was worth it. Every single Advil Tylenol I had to take just walking around like this for the next month. Crazy, and it clinched the only 30 homer, 30 double, 30 steal, 20 triple season ever. How about that? Yep, I didn't know that. <laughs> You're welcome. I didn't know that. Jason, you always got some interesting stuff for me. You, he always asks some interesting stuff for I me. I try, yep. I try. Here's one I know you remember. Let's go back to June 14, 2014. One more hit to become the all-time leading hit king in the history of the Phillies. What happened there? Uh, I got the hit. <laughs> yeah, <you did. laughs> I got the hit. A line drop toward right field. There it is. Jimmy Rollins is now the franchise leader in base hits with 2,235. Here comes Michael Jack yeah. Schmidt. The Phillies, they're good for that. They're good for these little <laughs> surprises. I, I didn't know anything. I just know Frank just kept saying, when are you going to get this hit? You know, <laughs> when are you going to get this hit? When are you going to get this hit? Because there's Mama and, and the baby, Cameron. Nice. And, you know, because, you know, Mike's around. So as long as we're at home especially, they're going to keep having to hide him. He's hiding out wherever, Hall of Fame club. I don't know. I don't know he's in the building. But a remarkable accomplishment for a remarkable person. I was never out to break any records or, you know, set any records just to be the best, you know, player I could be. I didn't even know that thing existed. I mean, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. No one ever thought about passing him up in anything. And uh, it just, if you're here long enough, you can accomplish good things, I guess. So um, he was very gracious, handed me the bat. I want to shake his hand. He was like, man, give me a hand and lift it up like it's yours now type of thing. And it's like, just humbling experience, like, that's Mike Schmidt, a Hall of Famer. And he's like, nah, 
it's you now. It's, it, it was awesome. They, in their heart of hearts, believe they want to win more than the guys on the field. Then you understand why they get upset. You understand why they may drop an F-bond and curse you out. Change up high towering drive. It's going to carry to deep left field and it is out of here. Home run, Jimmy Rollins. All right, so there's Jimmy, there's J Roll, and then there was the, this whole Nostradamus phase that you went through. Right. So the 2007 Nostradamus, awesome. Awesome. The next year, what'd you predict? You predicted we're going to win, win 100, 100 games. We can win 100 games. I mean, look at what happened to us last year with all the injuries and all the different pitchers and the uncertainties of last year. We wound up winning 89 games, I think it was. Okay, so you were wrong about that, but the good news Technically, was you won the World Series. Yeah. So was that the greatest wrong prediction of your lifetime? Uh, by far. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't even know why I said that, honestly. It was, it, you know, last year, was the year before was so good. And just one of those goal setting things, like, you know, we can win 100 games. Leslie, Gale, Leslie Goodell had asked me about it, and I'm just like, it's kind of like, why not? <laughs> why not? If, 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 if we can win the division, our next step shouldn't be just on winning the division, because that might be tough to do. But if we win 100 games, we focus on winning 100 games, I highly doubt we'll lose the division. <laughs> but more than anything, Struck him out. <laughs> Philadelphia Phillies 2008 World Champions of Baseball. And that, 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 was, that was the most important thing. Jim, let me ask you about Philadelphia. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's pretty clear now how Philadelphia feels about you. Right. But along the way, there was some stuff. There was some moments. Some. Some. Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. How, how would you describe that journey, you and Philadelphia? It was fun. To be honest, I mean, e even going through it, I, I, I never, I, I never complained. I mean, I may have complained about treatment of players at times, uh, but never about the way they treated me. I had Larry Bow as my first manager, John Vukovic uh, as a bench coach. That was a tough clubhouse. Uh, my dad was, you know, raised us tough. So when I was in there, you know, you're in there with these tough guys. I just kind of <laughs> laughed. It's like. I'm scared of my dad. <laughs> you guys don't scare me, you know? And, and that was my mentality with, with the city, but I learned the mentality of the city through those guys. They were tough. They didn't give you breaks. They, they didn't take failure as an option, and they didn't take a lack of effort as an option. It became a family type deal. You know, you could talk about your brother, you could talk about your sister, but if somebody else on the outside does it, now you got a problem. You guys can argue back and forth, but that's family stuff. And that's what it was like once you establish yourself being here so long and understanding who the fans are, understanding that they, in their heart of hearts, believe they want to win more than the guys on the field, then you understand why <laughs> they get upset. You understand why they may drop an F-bond and curse you out on a way uh, from a bad inning. But then you understand the same reason why that next half inning they're giving you a standing ovation and cheering you on and pumping you up. They just want to see you do, do well. They want to know that while you're in this uniform, you want to win just as much as we do. And if you don't, we want you out of here. You know, you never accepted the idea that just because you, you were your size, you should be some little slap-hitting, right. Juan Pierre kind of guy. And maybe you were ahead of your time. Um, I mean, do you almost wish that you started your career in this era? Yes. As opposed to that era? Yes. You know how much less trouble I, I, I would have gotten in? <laughs> right. I mean, how many times I was called Willie Mays Hayes, and I would just laugh. I'm like, you guys don't get it. Like, yeah, I mean, if I'm running the ball, of course it's going to be a pop-up. But when I get through it, it's a double. And, and then if it gets good backspin, it maybe goes out the yard. Um, but I, even, even while playing, Jason, I never knew how short I was until Ryan was on one side <laughs> and chasing Dominic Brown on the, on the other side. And I'm just like... This is so not fair. Like, why? And, and they did it on purpose because they knew the cameraman was right there to make me look like a little <laughs> Smurf hanging out with the big guys. But, you know, um, really, I, I really felt that when you're on the field, when you're playing sports, 
Height is neutralized by talent and heart. Height is neutralized by my knowledge of what to do with what I have versus do you have the knowledge to know what to do with what you have. There are going to be some things naturally I'm not going to be able to do and you know, you're going to be able to do better than me, hit the ball further, maybe make certain plays, but for what I can do with what I have, I'm going to try to do it better than what you can do with what you have. And that just kind of neutralized height for me. It, I never, I've, I, and I've never saw myself as a little guy. My dad always said, it doesn't matter how big you are, just be as strong as you can be. So me being as strong as I was in my five foot seven body, getting the most out of me, as they say, pound for pound in boxing, <laughs> pound for pound, I, th I think I'm better than you. And I was going to ask you whether you're a Hall of Famer. It feels like that's an impossible question Very, to ask somebody. Yes. So, so let me ask you this. I, I know you, this is another thing you've been vocal about. You've always talked about wanting to be a Hall right. of Famer. Why were you not a afraid to say that. It feels like in baseball people are afraid know, to say that sort of I thing. I know. Just, just just like some people were afraid to say we're the team to beat. <laughs> you know, you have, you, have to, you have to aspire to something. You know, ever since I learned about the Hall of Fame, I really knew what it was. I said about eight, it was about eight or nine years old. You know, I didn't really know what it was, but whatever the Hall of Fame was, I wanted to be in there because I knew it was an achievement. Not everyone is going to get in there. And you can't just walk up and like, hey, I want to be in the Hall of Fame. You have to earn that. So my ambition from the time I began really playing baseball was to be in that top tier of players. And if I fall short or if I fail short, that doesn't mean I wasn't good. But I was always looking above. I was always looking to be better. I'm not going to sit here and just sit on how good I am because there's someone better than me. And I want to be just as good as that person. So I, I would say that. And I think a lot of people you know, misconstrued that to saying, I am Hall of Famer. I'm going to be, not literally what I said, I want to be, I aspire to be a Hall of Famer. And no matter how good you think you are, you look up and look at some of those great numbers, it's like, shh, I'm a long ways away. I have work to do. And so you keep working and you keep pushing. And then at some point, they're going to take the jersey from you and you're going to sit there and just look like, did I do everything I could to get the best out of my ability? And if you did that, then you can look in the mirror and be proud of yourself. After that, you know, there's a vote that happens if you've done well enough to be on the ballot and, and you let it fall where it may. But it was always, those my aspirations. Not I, I am, I'm going to be, just that I want to be. At, at any rate, I'm glad that you were here on Baseball Stories, Jim. Thank you very much. I appreciate man. you, brother. Pleasure. Yes, sir.